name is Anya Vilgopola and I work in Institute of Geophysics Polish Academy of Sciences. And today we're going to talk about uh, climate change again. Uh, many of you participated, as I see, in my previous lesson, but from a bit different perspective. We're uh, going to discuss how it influences uh, biotic environment, that is living organisms, and we are going to focus mainly on animals and plants. Uh, it is always good to begin with a joke or a quotation, so I decided to start with a quotation. Uh, let's uh, look a bit closer at it. Uh, it's from The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin that was published in 19th century. It was a groundbreaking work uh, considered a foundation of whole evolutionary biology. And the full title uh, of this book is actually On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favorite Races in the Struggle for Life. So it works perfectly for today's lesson. Uh, Darwin uh, included evidence that he gathered uh, on uh, his Beagle expedition in the uh, 1830s, findings from research, correspondence and experimentation. It basically shook the foundations not only of science but also of traditional religion. And uh, what this uh, quotation says is the essence of, of the evolution uh, theory, that generally the adaptation is a way of not only survival, but also expansion of organisms. So uh, today we're going to find out what is adaptation, or what are the mechanisms that rule adaptation, uh, how does environment shape species, and how does climate uh, shape uh, the species, their construction, their behavior. Also, how did the climate affect human, human race in the past? Uh, what is tolerance range of, spe uh, of species, uh, why is it a problem, what, why is it actually quite difficult for organisms to adapt to climate change, or maybe there are some species that are able to cope with it. And uh, in the end, we're going to say a few words about those who are beneficiaries of climate, uh, of climate change. Uh, in, uh, please listen carefully. Uh, because at the end we're going to have a Kahoot uh, quiz, a short one, and all the answers are included in, uh, in today's lecture. So, uh, the adaptation. It is a process that makes organisms better suited to their habitat, basically. Uh, also, uh, we should uh, understand the difference between adaptation, adaptiveness, and adaptive stress. Adaptation, like I said, is a process, an evolutionary process, in which organisms become better able to, to live in its uh, habitat and a set of uh, parameters. Adaptedness is a state of being adapted. It is a degree to which organism is, is able not only to live, but also to reproduce in a given set of, of habitat of its parameters. And the adaptive threat is such an aspect of its development, of its construction, of its behavior, that enables probability of the organism to survive and uh, to, to reproduce. Uh, adaptation may uh, cause either gain of a new feature or the loss of the ancestral feature, uh, which is not uh, no, no longer uh, useful. In the image, we see a very classical uh, uh, example of adaptation. We see an original species which is now uh, extinct. And uh, all those birds around him uh, are, his, are his, let's say, uh, evolutionary uh, offspring. And the main difference we can see uh, at once is uh, the construction of their backs, which is adaptation to different types of, uh, of food and how they, uh, how they collect it. But uh, we should not uh, think that um, adaptation or evolution is something that happens only to visible organisms, to animals and plants. This uh, little fellow uh, here is a bacteria, Escherichia coli, uh, which it is actually, uh, actually uh, evolving in, in, before our very eyes, because it's evolving its ability to, uh, for example, in laboratory uh, conditions, to use citric acid as a nutrient if it's surrounded by, by citric acid. So uh, evolution adaptation is something that happens to all organisms, even the tiniest. Uh, tiniest. Uh, 
And the basic uh, mechanism, uh, the, the essence of, uh, of adaptation uh, and evolution is natural uh, selection. Here in the right, you can see an, an original um, piece of original uh, paper by uh, Darwin, who uh, wanted to understand the mechanism. And on the left, uh, it's explained, uh, I think, uh, rather graphically uh, how, it, how it occurs. Uh, because it's always about rates of reproduction and mortality. Let's see, uh, for example, snails. In the, in the beginning, there is overproduction of uh, snails. There's abundance of food and they reproduce uh, rapidly. There, there are plenty of them. And also, we have a variation. In this case, let's say, uh, some snails are uh, bright and some uh, are, are dark. This is a, a very visible uh, variation. Then there is a natural selection. Uh, let's say that uh, bright uh, snails are uh, visible to predators, so they become their prey uh, easily. Uh, so uh, there, there, are, there are less bright snails uh, left. So the darker uh, snails reproduce uh, successfully, and their offspring is also is also dark. And uh, as a result, after a um, few cycles of uh, of reproduction, the better adapted dark snails be uh, begin to uh, dominate because nature has sort of filtered out the, those that are pure, poorly suited individuals. Uh, and this is how the population and the, as a result, the whole species has evolved. Now let's look at this picture. Do you think that uh, it is always the case that, uh, that life is born uh, in water and then uh, is adapting, was adapting to uh, living uh, on land? This is what this classic uh, image would suggest that uh, it, it, was, it all began in the water. And all in the direction of evolution is to adapt to land living. Well, it is not uh, always uh, the case uh, because, uh, as you see here, uh, in the um, down, uh, down down right corner, we see a whale, which is uh, of course a sea uh, mammal, but. Uh, or in the top uh, left, um, in, to, in top left corner, we see its uh, short dwelling ancestor, a land ancestor. Uh, it was uh, called Synoxus here, uh, top left. It is a hyena. It was a hyena-like uh, animal, and about six, uh, 60 million years ago, it began to evolve. Uh, by those uh, transitional forms you, we can see from uh, top to bottom with very difficult names I'm not going to repeat. And uh, in the end we have a modern humpback whale. So it is not always the case that uh, it's, the life is evolving from water to land. And this is also why, for example, dolphins are closely related genetically to camels, visible also, also here in the image. Uh, because they had a common land ancestor, but their adaptations took different adaptations to, um, to environment, took different paths, and uh, actually the, the sand, uh, their, their ancestor was hiding underwater from uh, predators, and this is after, how after millions of years we have now uh, dolphins related to come. And how uh, are organisms shaped by the environment? Actually, in all the ways, because the because, uh, environment influences construction and also behaviors. For example, before snakes uh, look the like they do now, because before they slithered, they had limbs that were similar to those of lizards. And to better adapt to the environment, which was small holes in the ground, they lost their legs. So this allowed them to fit into tighter space and uh, they could hide from, from predators. Uh, we also see here uh, a mouse. Mice have uh, very large ears, which is also an adaptation to environment, a result of evolution. Uh, this is because they are basically nocturnal creatures and they do not have night vision. So uh, they have to rely of their on their uh, hearing capabilities. 
And having larger ears enables them also to uh, hear oncoming predators, and they're quite quick, so they're, they, they're able to escape from a snake or a bird of prey. Uh, it does not limit only to uh, animals, because plants adapt to the environment by modifying their leaves, their stems, their roots. For example, uh, for example uh, desert plants, such as cactus, visible here, uh, modify their leaves into thorns to prevent loss of moisture through transpiration. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you know, uh, because there is a whole lesson dedicated to Arctic tundra and adaptation of plants to this harsh uh, Arctic environment, which I hi highly recommend, so plants adapt uh, as well. And, of course, the kings of the Arctic, from top to bottom, polar bears' bodies are perfectly coordinated with, uh, with harsh conditions uh, of Arctic and also with the season seasonal shifts in the Arctic. Because their fur covers uh, a thick layer of fat, their ears and tails are small to limit heat loss. Their poles uh, also allow them to tread on, uh, on uh, thin ice. So, so they're perfectly adapted to Arctic as it is and hopefully will be uh, for a while. Some say that, uh, well, there are gaps, there are holes in evolution uh, theory. It's not so sure uh, how it's actually uh, occurred well. Uh, we have an evidence, unfortunately, that it's happening before our very eyes. And this time, the, uh, the uh, environmental factors that influence uh, construction of organisms are human, are, uh, are poachers, are hunters. Because uh, now there is an increasing number of African elephants that are now born tough, but it's without ivory. Because uh, uh, hunters have consist consistently targeted uh, animals with the best ivory over decades. And that, is, that has altered the gene pool uh, fundamentally. And in some areas, there are 98% of the female elephants that now, now have no pelt. And uh, researchers say that it, it is a clear uh, evidence of their evolution because it's compared to between 2 and 6% uh, individuals born dustless uh, on average uh, in the time. So humans are also an um, Giant uh, environmental um, uh, had giant environmental impact of, uh, on the evolution of uh, of species. Uh, so why is climate change so dangerous from point of view of uh, of biotic uh, uh, biotic environment? First of all, there is a uh, loss of habitat uh, because changing temperature, changing precipitation, and um, other climate factors. Uh, may destroy uh, habitats uh, directly or may change ecological conditions which are required for the survival of certain plants and, uh, and animals. Uh, for example, uh, if there are higher uh, temperatures in the summer, uh, they reduce quality and quantity of freshwater habitats necessary for uh, salmon and other cold water, uh, cold water fish. And also, rising sea levels uh, might uh, destroy directly very important habitats for many species of fish, wildlife, and plants, which are uh, uh, coastal marshes, uh, etc. And also, uh, there is an increased severity of extreme phenomena like wildfires, floods, droughts, uh, also diseases and insect outbreaks that that could destroy a suitable uh, habitat. Uh, for example, increasing ocean acidity, we also talked about uh, the, the on the previous lesson, uh, is already affecting shellfish and uh, it is likely to have a profound impact of, on the whole marine uh, uh, food loss. Uh, so, uh, and about shifts in phenophases and spread of uh, invasive species and disease, we are going to talk uh, in detail later. But uh, now uh, humans are said to have a giant impact on climate change, but uh, it was reversed in the past. Actually, um, it is researchers uh, claim that uh, climate change in the past affected how we developed uh, pr profoundly. 
because uh, ever since our ancestors branched off the, the, the evolutionary tree, that was millions of years ago, uh, the planet has faced uh, some swings between moist and dry periods, uh, glacial freezes, thaws, and uh, it is clear that early humans were able to survive such changes or existence compared to success. But uh, those shifts may have also uh, influenced some um, defining traits of uh, humanity and maybe in a good way. Uh, there are few large uh, evolutionary leaps such as, such as having bigger brains, using complex tools that seem to coincide with significant climate uh, change uh, in the past. Uh, for, for instance, uh, there is an idea that uh, one of the big leaps forward, uh, that is um, walking uh, upright uh, instead of climbing, uh, climbing trees, uh, was caused by uh, Africa switching from wooded areas to open grasslands. And let's uh, watch a short movie about it. It's, unfortunately, it has no sound, but I find it quite interesting. It is also said that it is this ability to adapt to change was what shaped uh, our, uh, our behavior. Like I said, making and using complex tools coinciding with climate shift. Even communication, communicating with symbols. Okay, coming back to our presentation. Um, okay. So, uh, it is all uh, based on tolerance uh, ranges of, of species, because each species, uh, plants and uh, animals, also bacteria, also humans, have not only geographic range, uh, ranges, borders of area where they naturally appear, they also have tolerance ranges for the abiotic environment uh, conditions. In other words, they can tolerate or survive within a certain range of a particular uh, factors, but cannot survive if there's too much or too little of the factor. And the factor might be sunlight, humidity, acidity, uh, oxygen, etc. And uh, peak temperature, for example, polar bears survive very, very well in low temperatures, but would uh, easily die from overheating in the, uh, in the tropics. And uh, like I said, all organisms have tolerance ranges, microbes, fungi, plants, animals, humans. Uh, uh, human technology allows us to live and work in more extreme environments, but we still are perfectly able to freeze to death and to die from a heat stroke, drown, suffocate, and die from exposure to acid. So it is not only limited to, uh, to, to animals and plants, uh, even though we have very protective uh, technology. So uh, how to explain tolerance ranges of species and difference of tolerance ranges of species easily? Look at those two graphs. If you draw a graph, uh, on, of how many individuals in the population live um, under which part of the range of any given factor, it is always 
like like this a uh, bell shaped curve uh, it, it looks a bit like like a bell uh, this horizontal axis could be any abiotic factor any uh, environmental condition let's say it's a um, oxygen level in freshwater uh, and uh, between those two uh, uh, species, these are two uh, pieces of fish. Which uh, one, the one on the left, on the one on the right, is has a larger tolerance range? Just a quick checking if you're still there. Which one has a wider uh, tolerance range? The um, the one on the right and the one or the one on the left. And in the meantime, I will answer to a question on chat as well. Right or left? Okay. Okay. The one on the left. Because this bell um, is let's say wider. That means that more uh, individuals are able to sur survive with very low or very high um, uh, levels of oxygen. And uh, if it's not a uh, level of oxygen, if it's something else, it, it's like temperature, it would mean that uh, the, the fish uh, on the left is able to survive, to, to adapt uh, better to, uh, to higher or lower uh, temperatures. Okay. Um, and if you look closely uh, that you, at the map of distribution of uh, species, you see that those preferences and needs of, uh, for certain types of conditions greatly influence the distribution of species around the planet. Uh, so those uh, species that have wider tolerance, tolerance range, uh, tolerance, tolerance range uh, are adapting easily and have also larger geographical uh, range, the area they occupy normally. And a little reminder of uh, phenology, which we are also going to uh, need. Uh, how do animals and plants know how to uh, behave, uh, where to start uh, growing, where to start, when to start opening uh, back, when to start to breed? Well, it's a combination of genes and uh, interaction with, with the environment. Uh, and those abiotic factors, three basic abiotic factors that are uh, influencing, influencing uh, their, their behavior is precipitation, sunlight, and uh, and temperature and all those maybe precipitation and temperature are greatly influenced by climate change and these three factors work together to determine the timing of natural events which is which we call phenophase and uh, how does climate change affect phenophases maybe let's look at the next uh, next slide where well, there are two types of responses to uh, changing climate. First one uh, is in space and the other one is in time. One in space is uh, called geographical, ge geographic response uh, to climate change and um, many species of animals and plants, uh, and plants um, expand their geographic ranges, ranges and generally they go Poleward, that is towards pole, uh, northward in the northern hemisphere, southward in the southern uh, hemisphere, or upward in elevation, in elevation over the last, last century, because um, they're either they're search, searching for um, cooler environment, or uh, it, is, it is it allows them the warmer environment allows them to expand their range. So generally towards poles on up uh, to the mountain, uh, let's say. And the other type of response is the response uh, in time, temporal response to climate change. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, generally um, expanding growing season and changing phenological uh, schedule. Uh, generally, we'd say that uh, spring is coming earlier uh, every year. And some might say this is great. Uh, we have more sun. Uh, we like it. generally we like it when, when it's warm. So it's great if uh, springtime and summer uh, are coming earlier, and and summer is lasting longer. But that is not always the case. It is not that simple because um, the mechanisms uh, are very fragile. The mechanisms of um, or, 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 uh, the whole ecosystem are rather um, are rather fragile, and we'll, we'll check that uh, on, a, on an example of Arctic uh, ecosystem. Uh, first, we already know that there uh, it identified seven species that are, according to researchers, hit the hardest by uh, climate change. We're not going to talk about all of them. But uh, as you can see, one of them is already a first confirmed victim of climate change. It's a golden toad that is already uh, extinct. And also you can see that three of them uh, here marked uh, in, in blue are um, organisms from polar regions, either from uh, north, like the polar bear on, or North Atlantic coast, but, uh, or from south, like uh, Adelie uh, penguin. So, how Arctic or polar species are uh, affected uh, by climate change? Like we said, uh, it's a loss of habitat, uh, but what is mostly striking uh, that is that um, Arctic is especially vulnerable because uh, of its food chain or food web. The food chain is rather short and the food web is not very much developed comparing to other parts of the world when we say that animals have more choice of food and some elements can be replaced. And in the Arctic, it is basically all based on zooplankton and which depend, and zooplankton depends strongly on water temperature, acidity and ocean currents and all of them are strongly affected by climate change. Uh, for example, uh, I said that uh, well, it's not the, so great that uh, uh, springtime is coming uh, earlier uh, each year, because uh, on the example of little oak, we see that um, uh, even though the growth season is longer, um, yeah, um, there is a mismatch in timing in the food density and the time when where, when the food is mostly needed because. Uh, uh, eggs are laid and legs are, are hatched. Uh, the population of uh, zooplankton has its peak uh, not in the same time as uh, it, it should from point of view of, um, of little oak. Uh, so the food becomes scarce and young birds don't get enough food. Adult body mass, uh, it is said that it has dropped an average of 4% since the early uh, 90, uh, 99. So uh, we have a strong evidence that it is actually uh, it, it, it is visible on the, uh, comparing to, to the average uh, body mass in, in the past. So uh, we already saw uh, seven species that are hit the hardest, uh, and there are also. Um, we are also identifying some uh, some species that seem to be adapting. Well, but it's identifying genetic adaptations uh, can be rather tricky because uh, we don't know uh, without long-term uh, data sets whether a species is truly evolving or is it just the plasticity. Uh, it is quite hard to tell if uh, there are genetic differences that are uh, passed from generation to, uh, to generation. But let's look at some, uh, some examples. Uh, like I said, uh, there, there are not, uh, we're not really convinced if there are genetic, uh, genetic changes. Uh, Dracids is a bird I think is rather common uh, in Europe. Uh, 
it is uh, it has adapted to uh, to this mismatch I was talking about uh, because uh, it, 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 it it's usually uh, it, it's mostly caterpillars and caterpillars are uh, maturing earlier this year as spring comes earlier and uh, Dratis is their predator and uh, isn't always able to uh, change schedule to hatch when the caterpillars are at, at their peak. Uh, so the bird numbers are dropping. But uh, there, is, there is some var variation observed in um, how, uh, how early they are able to hatch their eggs. Uh, in 32 years, it is observed that uh, there is a greater genetic selection for birds, uh, for birds that could vary their egg laying time to match the caterpillar's arrival. So we would say it is a uh, temporal response to climate change. We, but we don't know, it's, it's still unclear whether it can change fast enough to beat uh, rising uh, temperatures. Another one is a uh, red squirrel. Uh, this one is from uh, North America, but is uh, closely related to our European uh, squirrel. Uh, it is very much the same case. Uh, with increasingly uh, warm uh, springs, uh, dry environment, uh, white spruce trees produce more cones. You can see here squirrel eating a cone. And uh, they have more to eat, which is uh, which is generally uh, good. But uh, the more cones uh, they eat in the fall, they, the earlier it is observed that the earlier they give uh, birth. Uh, it's more or less two days per year over the last uh, decade. So it's also a temporal response. A fruit fly, it is very well known, uh, common and used for genetic experiments because it varies a lot and changes easily genetically from generation to generation. And uh, this, uh, this one is from uh, Australia. So a uh, research team found that many fruit flies living in southern Australia now have developed genetic mutations common in the more northern population. But remember, it's Australia. Uh, it's, everything is upside down. So uh, it's like it has moved nearly uh, four degrees in latitude. And scientists suggest that these changes are linked to coping with a warmer and drier climate. And similar trends have been found in Europe and North America. Uh, Soki salmon. It is always also a temporal response. Uh, some are migrating earlier every year in the spring uh, to spawn. Uh, luckily, uh, we have a very long-term uh, data set. Over 60 years, they have been observed for over 60 years. And uh, this is also uh, obviously because of warmer river temperatures that are, uh, that are to blame. And here we have a different type of response. Uh, this is a banded snail, uh, which uh, has different types of shell coloration, just like in the example re uh, regarding natural selection. Uh, snails with light shells uh, are better adapted to high temperatures because, uh, because it protects them. The ones with, uh, with darker shells uh, are not able to survive in uh, higher temperatures. And uh, because of warmer temperature, bioluminescence, no, no uh, uh, I, I can see a question, it is, it is not actually bioluminescence. They have a, uh, this is their normal coloration. It is not, not luminescent. It is uh, either da dark or, or lighter. And uh, because of, uh, um, because of climate change, because of rising temperatures, those with lighter shells be became very much predominant. Uh, so uh, why is it so difficult? Why are we even talking about uh, adaptation as a problem to, to biotic environment? Uh, it is not um, even the, the, the scale of, the, of climate change of temperature rise. Uh, 
uh, but it is uh, it is a question of uh, how rapid it is because most land animals uh, are said not to be able to evolve quickly enough to adapt to the dramatically warmer climate change, which is expected by uh, year 2100. Uh, it is said that many species will face extinction. Uh, actually, uh, scientists say that one in six uh, species are going to extinct directly because, I can, uh, because of climate uh, climate change. It is said that um, species are um, usually adapt to different climatic conditions at a rate of only about one uh, Celsius degree per million year. But uh, predicted change is four Celsius degrees per 100 years. So it is too rapid for most uh, species to evolve to adapt. Uh, but they try, uh, even in most uh, harsh and vulnerable uh, ecosystems. Uh, this is uh, our king of the Arctic that uh, is also uh, a victim of, of climate change and trying to cope with it. And uh, researchers observe at least four um, strange, strange, uh, unusual behaviors of, uh, of polar uh, birds. First, um, uh, it, is all, it is all related to food which becomes scarce because of uh, lack of ice, which is their environment to, to hunt. Uh, they have been acting so strangely that it is observed they come closer and closer to humans. Like lately, five birds surrounded a team of scientists at a weather station in Russia, trapping people inside. No, no one got hurt. Uh, but they're getting really close in search for uh, food. So uh, those unusual behaviors are putting leftovers of their uh, food on ice. This is not what uh, polar bears usually do. They eat everything, uh, but, but lately they are leaving some for, for later. Also, they're varying their diet. Uh, their diet is normally based on 90% uh, on, on seals. But now they uh, also add uh, bird eggs, plants as a sort of a backup source. Uh, what's interesting, but uh, researchers are still not quite sure if it's actually the, the case because it's quite hard to observe. Though to observe uh, is so-called active hibernation. Uh, in the summer, uh, you know that the polar bears do not hibernate normally, and they still don't. But it is observed that they might reduce their metabolic rate and activity level when food is scarce. So they don't go to sleep, but they're rather um, active uh, hibernation. Uh, this adaptation keeps animals from losing too much weight, even uh, if sea ice loss reduces their ability to hunt uh, seals. Like I said, they're getting closer to humans and uh, not to eat human, but to eat human food. Uh, like litter, uh, in Canada, um, there, there are special litter bins in some uh, cities protected from uh, polar bears because they they're, uh, destroy them in search for, uh, for food. They're, they're called polar bear proof bins. And there are also, uh, there's also special equipment carrying them off with uh, loud sounds. Uh, loud sound. So uh, in some northern areas, it becomes uh, a problem. Uh, here we have uh, some examples of quite interesting adaptations that are said to be actually uh, evolution and not plasticity. That is, they're um, passed from generation to uh, generation. Uh, so evolutionary adaptation usually happens over at least thousands of uh, over uh, thousands of years. But when species are under very, very strong selective conditions, and the adaptive evolution can tend to happen more, uh, more quickly. Uh, so, for example, Tony Owl. Uh, it usually has white plumage uh, because it, because of it, it was very hard to spot in snowy woods. But it is observed for 30 years that as there is less and less snow, the plumage becomes more brown-gray to allow birds to hide in the woods 
with with no slow uh, with no slow cover. Uh, so the brown plumage is a result of dominant gene, but historically the recessive gene of pink plumage trail having advantage because uh, it was better to uh, to hide like like this. Uh, also, you can see here a two spot late debug. Two spot late debug populations used to comprise two forms melanin and non uh, melanic and non melanic form. That is black with uh, red, uh, red dots and red with uh, black dots. And now we have only non melanic form. Uh, this color combination red with uh, black, uh, black dots, which also keeps them from overheating, just like those vented snails we talk about. As uh, we already talked about pink salmon, which is protecting its eggs uh, in warmer waters by migrating early before um, water becomes overheat. And what is also interesting is an uh, example among plants. While wild thyme uh, is now producing uh, more fragrant oil to protect from herbivores, the, for the animals that eat them, because the, those animals have become more and more common due to, uh, due to climate change. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the very end, uh, who's the beneficiary? Uh, there are some uh, animals which have a very large tolerance uh, uh, range, uh, so they are able to adapt to the to variety of habitat conditions uh, that actually benefit from uh, from uh, from climate change. Uh, like I said, their uh, tolerance range is, is quite wide. They also grow and reproduce rapidly. Uh, they are able to compete very aggressively for food, for for water, for uh, for nesting sites. And uh, when they move to uh, new uh, ecosystems, new environments, they actually lack natural, uh, they don't have natural enemies, they don't have pests, so uh, they're privileged uh, uh, comparing to those that are native. Um, so uh, some invasive uh, species, which might be plants uh, or animals, uh, are not native uh, to a specific location. Uh, mm, have a tendency to spread to a degree believed to cause damage to the environment, to the human economy or human uh, health. Sometimes they're introduced by humans uh, on purpose or uh, by accident, by, but sometimes they uh, just expand by, by themselves. And the result of their, they are displacing native species uh, reducing and changing, uh, reducing uh, native wildlife habitat because they're changing ecosystem and altering the whole ecosystem processes. So, so they're uh, quite dangerous and the invasive species and climate change are called uh, killing duo. Uh, for example, we have a uh, Arctic fox and a uh, red fox. Red fox is the largest of, of foxes and the, has the greatest geographic range of all members of the carnivoral family. They, they have a large uh, tolerance range and um, apart from its uh, large size, the red fox is distinguished by its ability to adapt quickly to new environments. Now it's moving north uh, to Alaska, but only to the Arctic and uh, it's considered a great threat to native Arctic foxes. Uh, and not only because it limits its habitat and alimentation, but sometimes it even hunts Ar Arctic fox, which is smaller and less gray. So, this is it for today. And now, if we still have uh, three minutes, I think uh, we can get ready for Kahoot Quiz. So prepare your uh, smartphone. You will get uh, a link and a pin code that will be displayed on uh, on the uh, uh, on your computers. Okay. Remember, there are four uh, possible answers. Only mark with color. First question: Geographical response to climate change means organisms are moving. Red, always south or up in altitude. 
blue, always north or up in altitude. Yellow, towards poles or up in altitude. Green, only up in altitude. The right answer is towards poles or up in altitude. Like I said, in the northern hemisphere it's always north and uh, in the southern uh, hemisphere it's always south. Or towards mountains, where it's generally cooler. So no good answers for now. Okay, polar bears show unusual behavior because of climate change, which is the red answer is all the answers are correct. Blue, active hibernation strategy. Yellow, storing food for later. Green, altering diet. Remember, it's not only the response, yes. Three good responses, great. They use all those strategies. Okay, it is not only important to give answer, but also to give it fast. Population of Arctic fox declines among others because red, they are very vulnerable to, to diseases. Blue, it doesn't decline at all, it's well adapted to climate change. Yellow, because of expansion of red fox. Green, polar bear, hunt them. Remember the photo? Okay, because of expansion of red fox, which is an invasive species, and also it is hunting Arctic fox. Okay. Question four. It is estimated that how many animals might become extinct directly because of climate change? Red, one of 50. Blue, one of 20. Yellow, 10%. Green, one of six. One good answer, one of six. This is quite quite many. Okay, I guess we have uh, almost have a winner, but let's check what's going to happen next. Question five. The biggest problem with climate change for animals and plants is that red, it is so large, blue, it is so rapid, yellow, none, adaptation to climate change is not a problem, Green, it is so slow. Why is it so difficult for animals to adapt to climate change? And plants too. Yes, because it is so rapid. Remember, it is quite difficult to uh, create uh, durable genetic changes uh, without thousands of years and the, the changes are happening much too fast for, uh, for most animals and plants to adapt. Okay. Oh, so there is a change in our scoreboard too. Two questions to go. Uh, question six. Tolerance range of species is something red. Only animals have Blue, also humans have, 
yellow only bacteria have or green only plants have. Yes, and most of you responded uh, uh, correctly. Yes, also humans have a tolerance range, even though we have technologies that allow us to widen them a bit. Okay, and the last question, I believe, oh, and the scoreboard first. It is changing. The last question, last chance. Invasive species is, choose one true statement. Red, referring only to plants. Blue, an indigenous local species, very dangerous and ferocious. Yellow, usually a species with wide tolerance range. Green, only species introduced by humans into environment. This is a tricky one, but remember why they're able to survive in different environments. And yes, they usually have a, uh, have a wide tolerance range, that's why they're able to adapt so easily. That was the last question, I believe. And we have a podium, so congratulations, congratulations the three of you. <laughs> uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And like we said, it is always possible to award students with a uh, with a with a with note.